Chapter 3 Aerodynamics of Flight Introduction All helicopter pilots must have a basic knowledge of the aerodynamic principles that enable helicopter flight. While the principles that apply to a helicopter are the same as those that apply to other aircraft, the application of these principles is more complex due to the rotating airfoils. Chapters 2 and 3 of the Helicopter Flying Handbook, FAA H-8083-21, and Aircraft Weight and Balance Handbook, FAA H-8083-1, form the foundation for this chapter. As with any training, begin the presentation of new material at the student's level of understanding. This can be determined throughout the introductory meeting with the student simply by engaging conversation about helicopters and general flight. Any previous flight experience will be apparent during pre-flight and while flying. Written or oral testing on the first day of flight school could deter a student from further flight training. A proficient, certificated flight instructor, CFI, should be able to determine the background and expertise of a student by careful use of the initial introductory meeting. The student's aviation background determines when to introduce different aspects of aerodynamics. The student must have the appropriate background knowledge to comprehend the subject matter. Periodic reviews during the course of instruction help the instructor tailor the lesson to the student's comprehension and arrange the material to fit the student's needs. Define new terms when first introduced. The overall objective of this chapter is to help the instructor review the aerodynamics found in the Helicopter Flying Handbook, FAA 8083-21, as revised, and help the student understand how those effects practically affect their helicopter flight. In order to control a helicopter in flight, the student must have the consistent ability to identify and compensate for varying aerodynamic forces in flight. Forces acting on the aircraft define and discuss the four forces acting on an aircraft in straight and level and unaccelerated flight. Give examples of how the combinations of these forces act on the airframe. 1. Thrust, the forward force produced by a power plant slash propeller or rotor. It opposes or overcomes the force of drag. 2. Drag of a rearward, retarding force caused by disruption of airflow by the wing, rotor, fuselage, and other protruding objects. Drag opposes thrust and acts rearward parallel to the relative wind. 3. Weight, the combined load of the aircraft itself, the crew, the fuel, and the cargo or baggage. The Earth's gravitational force, which creates the weight, pulls the aircraft downward. 4. Lift, overcomes the downward force of weight to allow flight to occur and is produced by the dynamic effect of the air acting on the airfoil and acts vertically through the center of gravity. Lift a very easy way to confuse new flight students is to throw a lot of obscure information at them with no concrete references or examples. Aerodynamics can be very difficult for the new student to understand because it is difficult to visualize what is happening to the rotor blades or tail rotor in flight. When teaching the student about lift and how the helicopter is able to obtain lift, the instructor must be creative and find ways to explain the theories, such as Bernoulli's principle and Newton's laws of motion, in direct relation to the helicopter and how every flight control movement affects lift. Bernoulli's principal instructor should introduce Bernoulli's principle to the student in simple terms and attempt to relate the theory directly to the production of lift that is created from the main and tail rotor blades. The discussion should begin with Bernoulli's initial discovery that air moving over a surface decreases air pressure on the surface, and show the student an example of the differences in air pressure when an object moves through the air. Further discussion should include the following points and examples. 1. Show the student a picture of an airfoil and how the air pressure changes when the air is disrupted. A picture of an airfoil is usually a small cutout or slice of the entire wing or rotor blade. The instructor should explain that the entire rotor blades are essentially one large airfoil. 2. As air speed increases, surface air pressure decreases accordingly and this difference in pressure around the airfoil is directly related to the flight of an aircraft. 3. As an airfoil starts moving through the air, it divides the mass of air molecules at its leading edge. The distance over the top of the blade with the angle of attack is greater than the distance along the bottom surface of the rotor blade. Air molecules that pass over the top must move faster than those passing under the bottom to meet at the same time along the trailing edge. The faster airflow across the top surface creates a low pressure area above the airfoil. 4. Air pressure below the airfoil is greater than the pressure above it and tends to push the airfoil up into the area of lower pressure. As long as air passes over the airfoil, this condition exists. It is the difference in pressure that causes lift. When air movement is fast enough over a wing or rotor blade, the lift produced matches the weight of the airfoil and its attached parts. This lift is able to support the entire aircraft. As air speed across the wing or rotor increases further, the lift exceeds the weight of the aircraft and the aircraft rises. 5. Not all of the air met by an airfoil is used in lift. Some of it creates resistance, or drag, which hinders forward motion. 
Lift and drag increase and decrease together. They are affected by the airfoil's angle of attack in the air, the speed of airflow, the air density, and the shape of the airfoil or wing. Newton's laws of motion Newton's laws of motion provide the foundation for the student's understanding of basic aerodynamic principles. The instructor should develop multiple ways of explaining these laws to ensure that if the student does not comprehend one explanation, the instructor has an alternate explanation that relates to something that the student will understand. Begin with relating the laws to helicopter flight, such as the requirements for lift, thrust, and power to overcome the effects of the three laws and the energy state of the helicopter. If the student has a difficult time understanding flight examples, try using an example that is more familiar, such as a car or motorcycle. This helps the student better understand the laws when the instructor applies it to flight. First law, the law of inertia a body at rest remains at rest, and a body in motion remains in motion at the same speed and in the same direction unless acted upon by some external force. The key point to explain is that if there is no net force resulting from unbalanced forces acting on an object, if all the external forces cancel each other out, then the object maintains a constant velocity. If that velocity is zero, then the object remains at rest. And, if an additional external force is applied, the velocity changes because of the force. A helicopter in flight is a particularly good example of the first law of motion. There are four major forces acting on an aircraft, lift, weight, thrust, and drag. If we consider the motion of an aircraft at a constant altitude, we can neglect the lift and weight. A cruising aircraft flies at a constant airspeed and the thrust exactly balances the drag of the aircraft. This is the first part cited in Newton's first law. There is no net force on the helicopter and it travels at a constant velocity in a straight line. Now, if the pilot changes the thrust of the engine, the thrust and drag are no longer in balance. If the thrust is increased, the helicopter accelerates and the velocity increases. This is the second part cited in Newton's first law. A net external force changes the velocity of the object. The drag of the helicopter depends on the square of the velocity. So, the drag increases with increased velocity. Eventually, the new drag equals the new thrust level and at that point, the forces again balance out, and the acceleration stops. The helicopter continues to fly at a new constant velocity that is higher than the initial velocity. We are again back to the first part of the law with the helicopter traveling at a constant velocity. In this example, only the motion of the helicopter in a horizontal direction is explained, and as the student becomes comfortable with aerodynamics, further discussions should include the effects of the thrust on weight and on lift. For example, increasing the throttle setting increases the fuel usage and decreases the weight, and the increase in velocity increases the lift as well as the drag. Each of these changes affect the vertical motion of the helicopter. It is important to point out the role of engine power when explaining the law of inertia. Power is used to accelerate the helicopter, to change its velocity, and thrust is used to balance the drag when the helicopter is cruising at a constant velocity. When a helicopter is on a normal approach, the power demand is generally in the middle range and the total drag is at the lowest. As the aircraft decelerates to effective translational lift airspeed and terminates to a hover, the power demand is quite significant, generally the highest of all maneuvers. An airplane makes minimal power demands at the termination of its approach through the flare and landing. Second law, the law of acceleration a change in velocity with respect to time. The force required to produce a change in motion of a body is directly proportional to its mass and rate of change in its velocity. For example, for a given helicopter, acceleration would be slower when loaded to maximum gross weight than when loaded to a lesser gross weight. During a normal takeoff, the power margin available between maximum torque available and hover power can be quite small based on helicopter weight and environmental factors. During the transition to forward flight and through effective translational lift airspeed, acceleration is limited until the aircraft is in smooth undisturbed air and the influence of induced drag begins to subside. Once the aircraft reaches its maximum endurance slash rate of climb airspeed, acceleration potential is increased as total drag is at its lowest point. Figure 3 1, point E, total drag is the sum of parasite drag and induced drag as shown in figure 3 1, point A and C. The total drag curve can also be referred to as the thrust required curve because thrust is the force acting opposite drag. At the point where total drag, figure 3 1, point D, and thrust required are at a minimum the lift-to-drag ratio is maximum and is referred to as L slash Dmax. At L slash Dmax, the entire airframe is at its most efficient, producing the most lift for the least drag. Maximum endurance is found at L slash Dmax, because thrust required and thus fuel flow, fuel required, are at a minimum, giving maximum time airborne. Third law, action and reaction for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. 
the instructor should relate the third law to the amount of power applied to the rotor system and the need for the anti-torque or tail rotor to supply the equal and opposite reaction to the torque of the engines applied to the main rotor. The rotor system of a helicopter accelerates air downward, resulting in an upward thrust. A single rotor helicopter demonstrates this law perfectly. Consider a helicopter on floats that is not moored to a dock. As the main rotor begins to turn counterclockwise during aircraft start, the fuselage reacts by turning in a clockwise direction until the point at which the tail rotor has reached sufficient RPM to provide the thrust necessary to counteract that force. Torque effect is a result of Newton's laws and an aspect of helicopter flight that a student must thoroughly understand. The turning of the helicopter's main rotor blades in one direction causes the helicopter to turn in the opposite direction. In most helicopters, this is counteracted by the use of a second rotor, tail rotor, to provide the thrust to limit the rotation. Some helicopters use vectored air, while others use a counter-rotating main rotor system. All have one thing in common, a method of counteracting the torque of the main rotor system. Figure 3-2, at some point in training, the instructor should have the student bring the helicopter to a high hover and explain that work load is greater and an increased left pedal requirement exists to hold a constant heading. The opposite can be shown at a lower hover with a decrease in left pedal requirement to hold the same heading. Weight as weight increases, the power required to produce lift needed to compensate for the added weight must also increase. This is accomplished through the use of the collective. Most performance charts include weight as one of the variables and students must be aware of the importance of managing aircraft weight to obtain optimum performance. By reducing weight, the helicopter is able to safely take off or land at locations that would otherwise be impossible. Explain to students how maneuvers that increase the G-loading such as steep turns, rapid flares, or pulling out of a dive create greater load factors and act as a multiplier of weight. The load factor is the actual load on the rotor blades at any time, divided by the normal load or gross weight. Figure 3-3, at 30 degrees of bank, the load factor is 1G, but at 60 degrees, it is 1.8G, an increase of 80%. If the weight of the helicopter is 1,600 pounds, the weight supported by the rotor in a 30 degrees bank at a constant altitude would be approximately 1,600 pounds. In a 60 degrees bank, it would be 2,880 pounds and in an 80 degrees bank, it would be 8,000 pounds. Emphasize to students that an additional cause of large load factors is rough or turbulent air. The severe vertical gust produced by turbulence can cause a sudden increase in angle of attack, AOA, resulting in increased rotor blade loads that are resisted by the inertia of the helicopter. Thrust thrust, like lift, is generated by the rotation of the main rotor system. Point out to the student that in a helicopter thrust can be forward, rearward, sideward, or vertical. The direction of the thrust is controlled with the cyclic. If cyclic control to produce thrust is too great, lift is lost and the aircraft descends. Conversely, if too little cyclic control is made, the aircraft begins a climb. Using visual aids, demonstrate how the resultant lift and thrust determines the direction of movement of the helicopter. Figure 3-4. Explain to the student that the tail rotor also produces thrust. The amount of thrust is variable through the application of the anti-torque pedals and is used to control the helicopter's heading during hovering flight and trim during cruise flight. Drag no discussion of aerodynamics is complete without its defining the three types of drag, how drag is created, and its effect on the aircraft. A certificated flight instructor, CFI, must become intimately familiar with the drag chart and how it relates to airspeed and power demands. Demonstrate this during the performance planning phase as the student has actual torque values to compare. Then, when the student is flying the helicopter, apply the values that were computed and show the effect on the helicopter. A technique is to show how each flight control is affected by simple hover flight maneuvers. Demonstrate the change in torque that occurs between left and right pedal turns and explain why. Discuss how the cyclic is utilized to hold position over the ground, while the pedals rotate the fuselage and control heading. When excess power is available, demonstrate how the collective pitch can be applied to vary the hover height, or to accelerate the helicopter. It would be prudent to discuss here that if no excess power is available, application of the collective then may be used to control the rotor RPM. This is done by changing the pitch in the blades. Over application of the collective in a low power margin setting results in rotor RPM decay and a loss of lift. Rotor RPM is the key to sustaining the aircraft in a steady state profile and should never be allowed to decay below minimum operating levels. It is the key to life for a helicopter pilot. The types of drag are 1. Parasite drag drag created by the fuselage or any non-lifting components, for example, strut, skin friction, interference. 2. Profile drag, caused by the frictional resistance of the rotor blades passing through the air. 3. Induced drag, 
Results from producing lift. A. Blade tip vortices, pressure differential at tips of blades trying to equalize and produce a stream of vortices, turbulence. B. Induced flow, causes lift and total aerodynamic force to tilt further rearward on the airfoil. C. Total aerodynamic force tilted further backward at higher angles of attack. 4. Total drag, sum of induced, profile, and parasite. Use a graph that depicts drag slash power relationship, and have the student identify the power requirements to overcome drag at various airspeeds. Figure 3 1, the following describes the relationship of each of the different types of drag to the airspeed of the aircraft. 1. Parasite drag, lowest point at a hover, but increases with airspeed. The major source of drag at higher airspeeds. 2. Profile drag, remains relatively constant at low airspeed, but increases slightly at higher airspeed ranges. 3. Induced drag, major source of drag at a hover, but decreases with forward airspeed. 4. Total drag, the sum total of induced, profile, and parasite drag. A. Total drag decreases with forward airspeed until best rate of climb speed is reached. Figure 3 1. Point E. B. Speeds greater than best rate of climb causes a decrease in overall efficiency due to increasing parasite drag. Once the student understands the forces acting on the helicopter, provide examples of balanced and unbalanced flight forces. For example, when hovering stationary in calm wind at a constant altitude, thrust is equal to drag and lift is equal to weight. The aircraft is not moving vertically or horizontally. The aerodynamic forces are balanced. Figure 3 5. The student will also notice during hovering flight in a calm wind condition that with smaller American-made helicopters like the Robinson R-22, Bell 206, and Schweitzer 300, the left side of the aircraft will probably hang lower than the right. This is due to the direction of the tail rotor thrust and the engineered mass tilt to compensate for translating tendency. On much larger helicopters such as the BH-205, S-76, and BK-117, in which an additional gearbox is used to raise the tail rotor up to the main rotor plane, the tilting of the fuselage is not as prevalent. The pitch attitude will vary depending on the loading of the helicopter. Many helicopters when flown single pilot will be nose high at a hover. Conversely, they may be nose load when fully loaded. The center of gravity CG, of the helicopter determines which portion of the landing gear will come off the ground first. The CFI must pay particular attention to the attitude of the helicopter as the student lifts it off the ground. If excess power is applied in other than a level attitude, the helicopter may proceed to roll beyond its dynamic rollover limits. When lifted off the surface correctly and safely, the pilot has the opportunity to lower the collective if a portion of the landing gear is attached or hung on the surface, thus preventing a rollover incident from occurring. It is imperative that the CFI closely monitor the attitude of the helicopter and not the actions of the student. This simple action may determine whether or not the helicopter is allowed to stray beyond the comfort level of the instructor to recover from a particular action by the student. Never allow a student to go beyond your comfort level. Several inputs are required simultaneously as the aircraft is brought to a hover. Stress to the student that these actions must occur without delay or coordinated flight will not occur. For example, as the collective is increased to lift the helicopter off the surface, the throttle must also be increased. Even if a governor accomplishes that action, the pilot still must monitor the power instruments to ensure that no limits are exceeded. With the increase in power, there is also an increase in torque and the tendency for the nose to turn to the right. The pilot must apply sufficient left pedal to maintain the helicopter heading. While this is occurring and the lift in the rotor system is changing, the pilot must apply cyclic to maintain position over the ground and not allow the helicopter to drift in any one direction. The helicopter bank attitude might not be level due to crosswinds and translating tendency. The pitch attitude might not be level due to tailwinds or CG. The pilot must ensure that the tail rotor is clear of all obstacles, and is not allowed to hang so low that it impacts the ground or other objects. For example, in steady state flight, the aircraft is maintaining a constant airspeed and constant altitude. The aerodynamic forces are balanced. Although the helicopter is moving, it is not accelerating or climbing. Figure 3 6, any time opposing forces become unequal, unbalanced, acceleration results in direction of the greater force. If lift is greater than weight the helicopter climbs. If thrust is greater than drag, the helicopter moves horizontally. Point out that thrust can occur in any or all directions. For example, if the helicopter is moving sideways or backwards, thrust is in the direction that it is moving. Figure 3 7, Airfoil define and discuss the different types of airfoils with the student and stress the importance of using standardized terminology. An airfoil is a curved surface body or structure designed to produce a lift or thrust force when subjected to an airflow. 
An instructor can check the student's understanding of airfoils and the terminology used to describe them by having the student draw and label the parts of an airfoil. Figure 3A, refer to the pilot's handbook of aeronautical knowledge and the helicopter flying handbook, FAA 8083-21, for definitions and illustrations of airfoil design. Blade Twist explained to the student that the rotor blade of a helicopter is designed with a twist to relieve the stresses on the blade and distribute lifting force more evenly along the blade due to the lift differential along the blade. Blade twist provides greater pitch angles at the blade root where velocity is low and smaller angles at the tip where blade velocity is higher. This increases the induced air velocity and blade loading near the inboard section of the blade. Rotor blade and hub definitions The CFI must be familiar with the following basic terms and be able to explain them to the student. 1. Hub, the attachment point of the rotor blades. 2. Tip of the blade, the farthest outboard section of the rotor blade. 3. Root of the blade, the section of the blade closest to the hub and where the attachment point is located. 4. Twist, the change in blade angle with respect to the angle at the hub outward to the tip. 5. Taper, the change, decrease, in blade cord with radial distance. These terms related to the rotor hub and blades are best discussed in the classroom and identified on the aircraft during a pre-flight. Airflow and reactions in the rotor system When introducing and describing the airflow in a rotor system, the instructor must first identify the types of relative wind. By defining and explaining the various air movements in a rotor system, figure 3-9, and the relationship of air movement to an airfoil, the instructor establishes a foundation for more detailed discussions of aerodynamic principles. The movement of a rotor blade through the air creates relative wind. Relative wind moves in a parallel but opposite direction to the movement of the rotor blade. The flow of air parallel to and opposite the flight path of an airfoil is rotational relative wind. It always meets the airfoil at a 90 degrees angle. The component of the total relative wind velocity created by forward flight velocity slash airspeed is airspeed relative wind. Induced flow, downwash, is a downward component of air that is added to the rotational relative wind. Resultant relative wind is the airflow from rotation, rotational relative wind, that is modified by induced flow. Upflow, inflow, is airflow approaching the rotor disc from below as the result of some rate of descent. Upflow also occurs as a result of blades flapping down or an updraft. A demonstration of the airflow in the following instances helps the student understand the concept of relative wind. Airfoil moving in one direction, rotating rotor blades, advancing blade, retreating blade, relative winds are the same for tail rotor rotor blade angles angle of incidence is the acute angle between the cord line of the airfoil and the plane of rotation, tip path plane, or the angle between the cord line of a blade and the relative wind. Sometimes, this is referred to as the blade pitch angle. The angle is changed through rotation of the rotor blade around its spanwise axis, which is known as feathering. Figure 310, an instructor can use training aids to discuss the angle of incidence in the classroom, but it is best demonstrated at the aircraft. Show the student how the angle of incidence is changed on all blades, except tail rotor, simultaneously by using the collective pitch control. Define this action as collective feathering and explain how it affects the overall lift of the rotor system. Demonstrate how the cyclic pitch control causes a differential change in the angle of individual blades, except tail rotor, and define it as cyclic feathering. Stress to the student that cyclic feathering changes the attitude of the rotor system but does not change the amount of lift. Figure 311, point out how the angle of incidence for the tail rotor is changed on all tail rotor blades simultaneously by using the anti-torque pedals. Stress that angle of incidence is a mechanical angle. Figure 312, remind the student that the OA is the acute angle between the cord line of an airfoil and the resultant relative wind. It can change with no change in the angle of incidence due to blade flapping and upslash downdrafts. Stress that angle of attack is an aerodynamic angle. Figure 312, discuss lift at different OAs. With the use of diagrams, an instructor can explain how the OA affects the amount of lift. An easy demonstration of how the OA affects lift is to remind the student of what happens if an arm is extended out of the window of a moving vehicle. Using guided discussion and demonstration, ask the student what happens when the palm of the hand is parallel to the ground and when it is rotated forward. Show the student how the hand rises until reaching the point at which it stalls and is just pulled rearward. Emphasize the following principles. 1. Larger angles of attack create more lift on an airfoil. 2. Smaller angles of attack result in a reduction of lift on the airfoil. 3. Exceeding the maximum, critical, angle can produce a stall. Maximum angle of attack is 15 degrees to 20 degrees on most airfoils. Hovering flight it is essential for the student to understand the aerodynamics of hovering. 
explain that for a helicopter to hover, lift produced by the rotor system must equal the total weight of the helicopter. An increase of blade pitch through application of collective increases the angle of incidence and generates the additional lift necessary to hover. As forces of lift and weight are in balance during stationary hover, those forces must be altered through application of collective either to climb or to descend. Describe to the student how, at a hover, the rotor tip vortex reduces effectiveness of the outer blade portions. Figure 313, vortices of the preceding blade affect the lift of the other blades in the rotor system. When maintaining a stationary hover, this continuous creation of vortices combined with the ingestion of existing vortices is the primary cause of high power requirements for hovering. Rotor tip vortices are part of the induced flow and increase induced drag. Ensure that the student understands that, during hover, rotor blades move large amounts of air through the rotor system in a downward direction. This movement of air also introduces induced flow into relative wind, which alters the OA of the airfoil. If there is no induced flow, relative wind is opposite and parallel to the flight path of the airfoil. With a downward airflow altering the relative wind, the OA is decreased so that less aerodynamic force is produced. This change requires an increase in collective pitch to produce enough aerodynamic force to hover. Translating tendency or drift explained to the student that the thrusting characteristics of a tail rotor during hovering flight create a tendency for the helicopter to drift laterally, which is called translating tendency. A single rotor helicopter with a counterclockwise rotating main rotor tends to drift laterally to the right. Stress the cause, thrust exerted by the tail rotor compensates for main rotor torque. Translating tendency is to the left in a helicopter with a clockwise rotation of the main rotor. Explain to the student that the helicopter fuselage will remain relatively level to slightly left side low. The amount of fuselage tilt varies between types and design of helicopters. The tip path plane of the main rotor will not be level and will have to be adjusted accordingly with cyclic to counteract translating tendency and adverse wind conditions. The ability to tilt or adjust the wings of the helicopter allows the helicopter to maintain its position over the ground. Describe the methods used to correct for translating tendency. 1. Flight control rigging may be designed by the manufacturer so the rotor disc is tilted slighted when the cyclic control is centered to compensate for drift. 2. Transmission may be mounted so the mast is tilted slightly when the helicopter fuselage is laterally level. 3. Pilot applies cyclic in the opposite direction to arrest the drift. Pendular action Pendular action is the result of the CG being below the supporting structure, rotor system. Tilting the rotor in one direction results in the fuselage swinging in the opposite direction. Stress to the student that this swinging is normal for helicopter operation since the helicopter fuselage is below the rotor system and over-controlling can result in exaggerated pendular action and should be avoided. The cyclic should always be moved at a rate that allows the main rotor and fuselage to move as a unit. Emphasize that the student should use slow, smooth, cyclic inputs while hovering. The student must understand that it is the relationship of the tip path plane to the horizon, and not the position of the fuselage, that determines the helicopter's direction of travel. Coning Coning is the upward flexing of the rotor blades. Point out to the student that coning is a normal phenomenon in all rotors producing lift. The amount of blade cones is a resultant between lift and centrifugal force. When lift is stronger than centrifugal force, the blade cones upward. When centrifugal force is stronger than lift, the blade moves downward, reducing the coning angle. Figure 314. Explain the relationship between lift and excessive coning and describe the causes of excessive coning to the student. Low revolutions per minute, RPM, less centrifugal force, high gross weight, more lift needed, high G maneuvers, more lift needed, turbulent air, point out to the student that any maneuvers requiring additional lift could lead to excessive coning. Give examples of excessive coning. Ensure the student understands. Flight conditions that require large amounts of lift may lead to an excessive coning condition in the rotor. As lift forces increase in the rotor, they overcome the rigidity produced by centrifugal force. The rotor blades begin flexing upward, which could lead to an excessive coning angle. Guide the student in identifying the adverse effects of excessive coning in the rotor system. Figure 315 1. Loss of disc area. 2. Loss of total lift available. 3. Stress on blades. 4. Excessive stress forces in the rotor could lead to blade cracking or blade separation from the rotor system. 5. Excessive coning combined with low rotor RPM may cause the blades to droop much lower than normal. This condition is likely to occur at the end of an auto rotation and may allow the rotor blades to damage or remove the tail boom. 6. Excessive coning may become unrecoverable in flight. Coriolis effect, law of conservation of angular momentum, 
the law of conservation of angular momentum states that the value of angular momentum of a rotating body will not change unless external torques are applied. Explain to the student that, in other words, a rotating body continues to rotate with the same rotational velocity until some external force is applied to change the speed of rotation. Angular momentum can be expressed by the formula, mass angular times velocity times radius squared discuss how changes in angular velocity, known as angular acceleration or deceleration, take place if the mass of a rotating body is moved closer to or further from the axis of rotation. The speed of the rotating mass increases or decreases in proportion to the square of the radius. These forces cause acceleration and deceleration. Tell the student that the Coriolis effect may be stated in the following terms. A mass moving radically. Outward on a rotating disc exerts a force on its surroundings in the direction opposite to rotation. Inward on a rotating disc exerts a force on its surroundings in the direction of rotation. The major rotating elements in the system are the rotor blades. As the rotor begins to cone due to G-loading maneuvers, the diameter of the disc shrinks. Due to conservation of angular momentum, the blades continue to travel the same speed even though the blade tips have a shorter distance to travel due to reduced disc diameter. This action results in an increase in rotor RPM. Most pilots arrest this increase with an increase in collective pitch. Conversely, as G-loading subsides and the rotor disc flattens out from the loss of G-load-induced coning, the blade tips now have a longer distance to travel at the same tip speed. This action results in a reduction of rotor RPM, and is corrected by reducing collective pitch. Ground effect defined ground effect for the student is the increased efficiency of the rotor system caused by interference of the airflow when near the ground. Discuss how ground effect permits relative wind to be more horizontal, the lift vector to be more vertical, and induced drag to be reduced, all allowing the rotor system to be more efficient. Maximum ground effect is achieved when hovering over smooth hard surfaces. When hovering over such terrain as tall grass trees, bushes, rough terrain, and water, ground effect is reduced. Explain the two reasons for this phenomenon, induced flow and vortex generation. Figure 316, gyroscopic precession explained to the student that precession occurs in rotating bodies that manifest an applied force 90 degrees after application in the direction of rotation. Point out that although precession is not a dominant force in helicopter aerodynamics, pilots and designers must consider it since turning rotor systems exhibit some of the characteristics of a spinning gyro. Figure 317 illustrates effects of precession on a typical rotor disc when force is applied at a given point. A downward force applied to the disc at point A results in a downward movement of the disc at point B. Aircraft designers take gyroscopic precession into consideration and rig the cyclic pitch control system to create an input 90 degrees ahead of the desired action. Figure 318 shows reactions to forces applied to a spinning rotor disc by control input or wind gusts. Vertical flight A student must understand that for climbing flight to occur, lift must be greater than weight. This is true whether at a hover or in steady state flight. Refer back to the forces acting on an aircraft in flight when explaining this concept. Forward flight when explaining forward flight to the student, refer to the section on forces acting on an aircraft in flight. Remind the student that flight is the result of all forces, and that lift and thrust must be equal to the result of weight and drag for steady state flight. Point out that acceleration in forward flight is the result of thrust being greater than drag. Translational lift Translational lift is the additional lift obtained from increased efficiency of the rotor system with airspeed obtained either by horizontal flight or by hovering into a wind. Describe the airflow patterns during directional flight and explain the causes of transitional lift. The relative wind entering the rotor system becomes more horizontal and results in the following 1. A more vertical lift component 2. Less induced drag 3. An increased OA4. Less turbulent air entering the rotor system The airspeed range at which effective translational lift occurs is approximately 16 to 24 knots. As rotor efficiency increases and additional lift is produced due to more beneficial OA, the rotor disc flaps upward causing the nose to pitch up, additional forward cyclic pressure is necessary at this point. As the airspeed increases and more lift is produced in the aft portion of the rotor disc, the nose tends to lower, requiring some aft cyclic to maintain an accelerative attitude and safe climb angle. Provide the student with a graph depicting drag at different airspeeds. Using a graph like figure 3-1 in guided discussion, ensure the student understands, 1. Each knot of forward airspeed increases the efficiency of the helicopter rotor system up to a point where retreating blade stall aerodynamics negate any further rotor system gains. 2. At effective translational lift, ETL, the rotor system completely outruns the recirculation of old vortices and begins to operate in smooth, undisturbed air. 3. Induced drag and total drag are reduced and overall rotor efficiency increases. 
4. Increased efficiency continues with increased airspeed until best climb speed is reached. Figure 3 1, point E, 5. Air speeds greater than best rate of climb speed result in lower efficiency of the helicopter due to increased parasite drag. Translational thrust Translational thrust occurs as the helicopter transitions to forward flight and the tail rotor begins to operate in smooth undisturbed air. As the takeoff proceeds, the pilot notices the nose yaw, to the left in a counterclockwise turning system. This is the result of the increased translational thrust. To regain trimmed flight, a little right pedal is normally required. At about this same aerodynamic point, the airflow begins to smooth over the vertical stabilizer which carries some of the anti-torque load in forward flight. This allows for slightly more reduction in tail rotor thrust, requiring further reduction in left pedal application. If there is no governor, a throttle change may be required to reduce the RPM slightly since the power demand was reduced. Depending on the helicopter's position and airspeed, the rotor result in RPM increase can be controlled by a slight increase in collective to maintain the RPM setting. Induced flow explained to the student that, at flat pitch, air leaves the trailing edge of the rotor blade in the same direction it moved across the leading edge, thus, no lift or induced flow is being produced. Demonstrate how, as blade pitch angle is increased, the rotor system induces a downward flow of air through the rotor blades, creating a downward component of air that is added to the rotational relative wind. Point out that because the blades are moving horizontally, some of the air is displaced downward. The blades travel along the same path and pass a given point in rapid succession. Rotor blade action changes still air to a column of descending air. This downward flow of air is called induced flow, downwash. Emphasize that it is most pronounced at a hover under no wind conditions. Transverse flow effect advise the student that in forward flight, air passing through the rear portion of the rotor disc has a greater downwash angle than air passing through the forward portion. Explain that this difference in downwash angle is due to the fact that the greater the distance air flows over the rotor disc, the longer the disc has to work on it and the greater the deflection is on the aft portion. Ensure the student understands. Downward flow at the rear of the rotor disc causes a reduced OA, resulting in less lift. The front portion of the disc produces an increased OA and more lift because airflow is more horizontal. These differences in lift between the fore and aft portions of the rotor disc are called transverse flow effect. Transverse flow effect causes unequal drag in the fore and aft portions of the rotor disc and results in vibration easily recognizable by the pilot. Transverse flow occurs between 10 and 20 knots. Stress to the student that transverse flow effect is most noticeable during takeoff and, to a lesser degree, during deceleration for landing. Demonstrate how gyroscopic precession causes the effects to be manifested 90 degrees in the direction of rotation, resulting in a right rolling motion requiring left cyclic input to maintain a more level fuselage attitude and proper ground track. Dissymmetry of lift Dissymmetry of lift is the difference in lift that exists between the advancing half of the rotor disc and the retreating half. Explain to the student how to determine the total relative wind velocity on the advancing and retreating blades. Discuss the relative wind velocity of blades at a hover and during translational flight. Hover at a hover, relative wind velocity is approximately 400 knots at the tips. Approximately 300 knots one-fourth of the way in from the tips. Approximately 200 knots one-half of the way in from the tips. Approximately 100 knots three-fourths of the way in from the tips. Zero knots at the center of the hub. Translational flight and translational flight, relative wind velocity is a combination of blade speed and airspeed. Of the advancing blade is blade speed plus airspeed. Of the retreating blade is blade speed minus airspeed. Develop the relative wind velocity for the advancing and retreating blades in the 090 degrees to 270 degrees position. Figure 319, show area of reverse flow. Emphasize that equal lift is created by advancing and retreating blades. 1. Advancing blade, greater lift. 2. Retreating blade, less lift. Discuss roll and explain that American-designed helicopters, counterclockwise rotation, would roll to the left and pitch up if transverse flow and dissymmetry of lift were not overcome. Explain main rotor method of overcoming dissymmetry of lift, flapping. 1. Advancing blade produces more lift, when flapping up, OA decreases due to an increase in induced flow, loses lift. 2. Retreating blades produce less lift, when flapping down, OA increases due to a decrease in induced flow, gains lift. 3. When blade flapping has compensated for dissymmetry of lift, the rotor disc is tilted to the rear. 4. Cyclic feathering also compensates for dissymmetry of lift, changes OA, in the following ways. A. Cyclic feathering changes the angle of incidence differently around the rotor system. B. 
forward cyclic decreases angle of incidence on advancing blade, resulting in reduced HOA, and increases angle of incidence on retreating blade resulting in increased HOA. 5. Tail rotor compensates for dissymmetry of lift by both flapping and feathering at the same time, accomplished by rotor design and mounting. A delta hinge allows for flapping, which automatically introduces feathering of the tail rotor. Exercise caution during a low altitude, high-speed takeoff as pitch attitude is very low. If an engine failure or partial power condition were experienced, the pilot would not be able to safely place the aircraft in an autorotative profile. A quick review of the height velocity diagram would be very useful here. Sideward, rearward, and turning flight explain to the student that to accomplish these different modes of flight, the rotor disc is tilted in the desired direction. The forces acting on the helicopter remain the same, only the resultant vectors are different. Sideward hovering flight requires more pedal control to maintain heading. Depending on the lateral speed of travel, some fuselage tilting can be expected. Rearward flight must be accomplished slowly and cautiously due to wind effects on the horizontal stabilizer and the lowering of the tail rotor making surface contact easier to occur. Auto rotation to help students better understand auto rotation, divided into four distinct phases, entry, steady state descent, deceleration, and touchdown. Guide the student through each phase, stressing how it is aerodynamically different from the others. Entry guide the student through the entry or first stage of auto rotation and explain that this phase is entered after loss of engine power. The loss of engine power and rotor RPM are more pronounced when the helicopter is at high gross weight, high forward speed, or in high density altitude conditions. Any of these conditions demand increased power, high collective position, and a more abrupt reaction to loss of that power. In most helicopters, it takes only seconds for RPM decay to bring RPM to a minimum safe range, requiring a quick collective response from the pilot. The entry into auto rotation must be immediate and smooth by lowering the collective, adjusting the pedals for the loss of torque, and adjusting the airspeed for the proper glide angle. The instructor should never initiate an auto rotation, or simulated force landing, unless there is suitable landing within glide distance in the event of a power plant or drive line failure. Discuss with the student the airflow and force vectors for a blade in this configuration. Remind the student that lift and drag vectors are large and the total aerodynamic force, TAF, is inclined well to the rear of the axis of rotation. An engine failure in this mode causes rapid rotor RPM decay. Inform the student that to prevent this, a pilot must lower the collective quickly. Explain to the student that as the helicopter begins to descend, the airflow begins to flow upward and under the rotor system. Steady state descent airflow is now upward through the rotor disc because of the descent. Once equilibrium is established, rate of descent and rotor RPM are stabilized, and the helicopter is descending at a constant angle. Angle of descent is normally 17 degrees to 20 degrees, depending on airspeed, density altitude, wind, and type of helicopter. The instructor should guide the student through any RFM procedures or charted values for minimum rates of descent versus maximum glide distance if provided for that helicopter. During this phase of the auto rotation, the aircraft is maneuvered to reach a safe landing area by adjusting airspeed and making turns as appropriate while maintaining rotor RPM at the proper range for the type of helicopter. Checklist items are also completed as time permits and a mayday call made. Explain to the student how the loss of engine power during the auto rotation requires the pilot to use the pedal controls to keep the helicopter in trim throughout the descent until the deceleration and touchdown point is reached, otherwise the increased drag would greatly increase the rate of descent. Also explain how the fuselage tends to weather vane into the wind due to the vertical fin. Deceleration explained to the student that to make an auto rotative landing, the pilot reduces airspeed and rate of descent just before touchdown. Both actions can be partially accomplished by applying aft cyclic, which changes the attitude of the rotor disc in relation to the relative wind. During this maneuver, the goal of the pilot shifts from maintaining an airspeed to attaining a minimum ground speed for touchdown while decreasing the rate of descent. Ensure the student understands that this attitude change inclines the lift vector of the rotor system to the rear, slowing forward speed. Increased airflow results in increasing RPM, which must be controlled with the collective. The lifting force of the rotor system is increased and rate of descent is reduced. During this stage of the auto rotation, the lack of torque is noticeable and the aircraft fuselage may rotate counterclockwise with application of the collective due to frictional drag in the transmission, drivetrain, associated pumps, and generators, depending on type of helicopter. Pedal application will be required to maintain a heading aligned with the touchdown area. Any crosswind also causes the nose to weather vane into the wind due to lift produced by the vertical fin. Touchdown during this final phase of the auto rotation with the airspeed at a minimum as required for the conditions of the landing area, 
the cyclic stick is moved forward to place the aircraft in a landing attitude while applying collective pitch to cushion the landing. The height at which this phase is entered depends on the size of the helicopter and the length of the tail boom. The landing attitude varies between helicopter designs from touching the aft portion of the landing gear first as in an airplane, to a level attitude with all surfaces touching down at once. Each manufacturer has a preferred landing attitude that must be used to. Heading control must be maintained with the pedals to preclude the aircraft from rolling over once ground contact is made. The instructor must ensure several conditions are met to allow the helicopter to arrive at that point. 1. The rate of descent, rotor RPM, and airspeed are all within established parameters, as well as landing area alignment and positioning. If any of these conditions are not within limits, re-engage the engine and make a power recovery or go around. 2. The landing gear is and stays aligned with the ground track of the helicopter. 3. The decelerating flare did not result in an increase in altitude, ballooning, or was not begun at too high of an altitude. 4. The student cannot be allowed to increase the collective too soon, and the student must be prompted to use available collective to cushion the landing soon enough. 5. The collective must be used to cushion the touchdown, but the student should not be allowed to hold the helicopter off the surface. 6. The student must not be allowed to retain an excessive decelerating attitude at too low an altitude allowing a tail boom or tail rotor strike. The student must be taught how to begin the flare and then decrease the nose high attitude to a landing attitude. 7. The student cannot be allowed to move the cyclic aft after touchdown. This generally allows the rotor blades to dip aft over the tail boom and when occurring at the same time as the actual touchdown, results in a tail boom strike. 8. The student cannot be initially allowed to lower the collective after touchdown. Once the helicopter is completely down and no longer subject to bouncing and flexing, some helicopter RFMs allow a slight decrease in collective to aid stopping and to decrease low RPM blade flexing. For a detailed description and illustration of auto rotation, refer to Chapter 11 of the Helicopter Flying Handbook, FAA 8083-21, as revised. Instructor tips, start the presentation of new material at the student's level of understanding. Figure 320 Check out internet sites such as the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, Beginner's Guide to Aeronautics, www.lerk.nasa. gov www k 12 airplane indexhtml for graphics and simulations for use in explaining aeronautics. Chapter Summary This chapter reviewed essential points to be taught during aerodynamics instruction. It provided the instructor with additional material that can be used in explaining aerodynamic principles, as well as examples to enhance the learning process.